You on out there? All right, let's get this thing moving. All right, guys, welcome back. Another episode of Dirt Exchange Podcast. We, uh, over the last few weeks, have kind of touched on the ATV side of of things. Um, as you might notice, this is not Andy. Andy is um, in Vegas, probably dancing with midgets and drinking beer and having a good time. So uh, hopefully he survives that and and uh, just remember what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. But today I got Justin Trowbridge with me. Welcome. Thanks, Thanks for Appreciate coming on. Uh, Justin and I go way back. What was it? Oh, or 2011, 12, yeah, 10. 10? 11, yeah. We worked at the same uh, auto dealership together and um, both left to kind of go do other things. And it was pretty cool, you know, kind of staying in touch and following each other on social media. Um, kind of both went in way opposite directions yeah. of the car business. Yeah, you were the, the one manager I didn't want to punch. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad for that. That, you know, as much as I love the car business, um, it can be a pretty volatile uh business and a lot of people unfortunately don't know how to handle it no. you know so it's been cool to watch you uh go through all the changes that you've gone through and the stuff that you've done and we're going to talk about something a little bit more agricultural than we have the last few times um kind of a controversial topic um so, yeah. but uh i think uh you know um we're going to learn a little bit more about it. i be honest with you, I don't know shit about it. So I'm excited <laughs> to... People in the state, so you're not, not far behind. Yeah, so I'm excited to kind of sit down and talk about it and go through it. So tell us a little bit. You work for Hemp Batch Tracker, yeah. right? And, and so we're talking about growing and producing hemp. Yep. So give us a crash course and let's kind of then expand on it, I guess. Sure. So... Um... Hemp on a federal level was illegal until 2018. Okay. Uh, the Farm Bill in 2018 passed industrial hemp. And the difference between hemp and marijuana is the amount of THC. Um, so hemp 0.3? Yep. 0.3% yep. or lower. Yep. Um, any of the, the marijuana strains you're going to buy out in the dispensaries in Colorado are 15 to 30% right. THC. So it's not like it's a, a little margin. It's like a huge gap. Yeah. Um, the problem is the, the hemp or the marijuana everyone was smoking in the 60s and 70s and all that was like 5% THC. So, gotcha. Um, it's definitely way more potent than, than guys that are been around from the 60s and all that. But, um, you know, hemp is, uh, we've always had it. All the feral hemp that grows in Nebraska was planted by the USDA for the war effort. So it's hemp for victory. Yep. Um, and it, it, we grow it really well. I mean, it's, I haven't, I've, I've fought my way through it, hunting pheasant and stuff like that. And So as a kid... Um, the place I lived on, it was a, a quarter of of ground, but you drive into our driveway and our house was off to the the right hand side, and then kind of in the middle of the yard, on the south side of the house was a big like storm cellar, yep. right, or canning cellar, you know, with whatever they used them yep. for back in the day, and always that thing, one hundred percent. Hemp plants or marijuana plants, yeah. you know, ditch weed is yeah, everybody re refers to it. And it was funny. We had these, these guys from, I forgot, they were from Florida or something. They came up to help custom harvest for silage yep. and they, they had never seen this before. Yeah. Like, they're like, oh my gosh, it just grows out there. And so they were cutting it down and setting it on top of their trucks, you know, making a joke <laughs> out of it. And I'm like, well, do what yeah. you want, buddy. But yeah. So anyway, sorry. No, that's right. No, I was, I was hunting out in uh, Taylor, Nebraska mm -hmm. years ago. And we saw, you know, we set up a turkey and saw a skunk jump off this, this fence line and run down like that. And it kind of followed the fence line up towards me. And I, I got on the, the radio the guy I was hunting with. And I was like, dude, I think that skunk's up here. And he goes, no, man, it's a field of marijuana behind you. I'm like, what? And the light was coming up. I turned around, 60 acres. Like, it went over the sand hill that I could see to the horizon. Really? It was just feral hemp. It was just yeah. going crazy yeah. in the sand hills. So, yeah. Well, and that's kind of where I grew up on the very edge of the sand hills. And yeah, I mean, it would be nothing to, you know, drive down the road and, and see it all along the ditches or, you know, next to somebody's, uh, or in somebody's corral that they hadn't had cattle in for yeah. a few years or whatever. It just grew like crazy. And obviously with wind and mm -hmm. birds and that kind of stuff, it's going to spread, yeah. you know, all over. So, yeah. So the, the main uses for hemp 
um, nowadays. Um, obviously, the cordage is still important because it can be used for rope and for textiles and things like that. Uh, Patagonia is making shoes and shirts, and um, the herd, which is the, the inside of the stock, is used for um, bedding. They're trying to get it approved for animal feed. Okay. Um, so we've got guys that grow Wagyu beef, and they want to yeah. feed their, their cattle. They want to feed them CBD yeah. so that they're more relaxed and they're more mellow. And it's a real high-protein seed, too, so it gets okay. good meat and all that stuff. Okay. So um, the Wagyu guys are chomping at the bit to, to feed hemp to their, their, their livestock and uh, the CBD oil, which is what everyone hears, and you see it in gas stations, stuff like that. Those, yeah, signs all, yeah. all over, yeah. So CBD is a molecule inside of, of the, it's a cannabinoid is what it is. Okay. And um, it reacts in the human body and does different things. You don't get high from it uh, if there's no THC, and if it's truly hemp, CBD. Um, there are people that blend it with THC to get the euphoric effects. But, right. Uh, like, I'm an old lineman. I mean, I yeah. have bad knees. I mean, I'm... I'm, I like to think I'm three years away from getting a knee replacement. I'm probably probably one or two. Right. But um, I take CBD in the morning and at night, and I don't have the joint pain that I used to. I, I've heard that. I listen to I mean, Joe Rogan's podcast. Yeah. I listen to him quite a bit, and he's a huge CBD guy. In fact, he had a um, an episode where it was him and Ted Nugent. Mm -hmm. And obviously, Mr. America, Ted, you know, Uncle Ted, um, never tried it, never yeah. touched it. And he, same kind of thing. He's, he's had a, a long, tough road that he's, he's gone down, you know, or, or whatever. And, and again, he's, he's getting up there in age and he's out, you know, walking the fields, he's hunting all the time, you know, and they were talking about the benefits of it. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's crazy. A lot of, I know a lot of professional wrestlers, yeah. ex-professional wrestlers use it for joint and, and, and body stuff. So. Um, I think MLB just just passed that because there was so much so CBD in massive quantities. I mean, if, if you're a major league baseball player in Colorado, you might be mixing substances out there a little right, bit. Right, right. But um, well, the Rockies are high. Yeah, it is very true. <laughs> Plenty of time in Colorado. It's, a weird, it's a fun state to visit sometimes, but living out there can be a little frustrating. Yeah. Too, so, but um, they uh, they dropped that that marijuana part of it because a lot of the guys were taking like super doses of CBD for joints and, then and muscle issues. And testing then positive. That minor trace, um, you know, it was just enough. So, but so, you see, so does CBD still have the 0.3% mm -hmm. in it? Okay. Then you can get into distillates and isolates where they take even more of it out. There's a, okay. a company out in um, Tennessee called Tennessee Harvester. They do THC remediation. Okay. So they'll take uh, CBD oil that's 0.3 and turn it into 0 0.001 or 0. Okay. Um, and then it gets put into all kinds of crazy stuff. What, so what's the benefit of that? I, I, like I said, I literally don't know anything about that. What's what's the benefit? Just the fact that there's no THC going into your body? Yep. Um, it's a it's a pure form. So it's, okay. it's the, the biggest thing is always the bioabsorption, right? Um, how fast your body can absorb that information. So yep. like I can give you a, a gel cap, you know, like an Advil gel cap. And you can take that. It'll go through your stomach and chances are it'll be absorbed by your intestines. Well, that could be 30 to 40 minutes for absorption. If I give you, it's called a tincture, which is just, you know, carrier oil underneath your tongue or something like that. Usually that's five to 10 minutes because it's going through your, like a, like chew does, right? Yeah. That's how you get, you know, the, the nicotine and all that. Or if you inhale it, like through a vape pen or even smoking it, because smokable hemp flour is something that, that's out there, uh, which is the best thing to put on a table at a farm show. Put out a, a big bowl of smokable hemp flour. Yeah. And watch these guys that grew up with hemp being, or marijuana being the villain and all that kind of stuff, and reefer madness and all that. And they walk by and they go, What the hell are you doing? Like, how much is that worth? And they're like, well, That right there is maybe 300 bucks or something like that. Right. It's, it's seven months old and it's dirty and gross. And, yeah. You know, but it's, uh, it freaks people out. I actually carry a five gram uh, bud flour like a, of hemp. Okay. Just because you'd be talking to people like, I almost brought it today, but I didn't think about it. But, uh, uh, you know, I put it in front of people and they see it and they've seen enough movies and things like that. Right. that it, it makes you feel awkward, right? It feels weird. But when you look at what you can do from a farming aspect, it, one acre of or one acre of hemp, CBD hemp, um, two, three years ago was $75,000 for an acre. Okay. This year, <clears throat> non-organic certified, you're looking at about $20,000 an acre. Okay. Uh, if you're USDA certified organic, you're looking at 
closer to 30 or 40 grand. And, and, and the reason for the drop is that because there's more people doing it yeah. now? It is, it's being more massively grown? Yeah. The So the up until, so when it was $75,000 an acre, that was when you had Oregon and Colorado, basically the two. Gotcha. Sports. Okay. And they're growing it on three acres in a valley around a corner, you know, some... Unusable land, really, yeah, right? somebody who doesn't know how to farm but thinks they can grow this stuff, and so they do. So they grow it in these little nooks and corners and all that stuff. Okay. When the Midwest gets up and running and they, they turn on the you know the diesel engine that is the Midwest for farming, it is going to completely change the landscape for hemp forever. So walk me through, if you know, the, the actual farming part of it, because yeah. I, I feel like... Nebraska or the Midwest in general is corn, bean, yep. you know, maybe some wheat and some, you know, other things. You know, I know uh, there's some some hops, sorghum. sorghum. Can the average farmer do this? Yep. So the I I literally just came from the innovation campus to, to present on this, where the easy way to do this is to present hemp as corn, because as Midwesterners we we've grown up with corn and soybeans. Yep. So I'll just do that real fast. But it's so imagine that corn is now legal for the first time in the United States. You can finally grow corn, thank God, right? Um, but soybeans are still illegal. You can't grow soybeans in the state of Nebraska because they're legal statewide. Uh, they're state legal for medicinal use in Iowa. They're state legal for recreational use in Colorado, or whatever. Right. So to start growing corn, you need to one get all the infrastructure set up. So the processing, the where do you drop the seed or the plant, mm -hmm. the biomass, where do you, you know, the, the corn, you know, slip back into, into the hemp for a second. Yeah. Um, so you have to go get a state license. Okay. State does background check. They take your, your thing and all that. And then they will, they take all your information and, and they, they run it through. But it takes about a week, week and a half. Got okay. Up, yeah, I talked to an old Gawala, got his in a week. That's actually pretty quick, really, That's considering really it's quick. the government. I mean, yeah, takes... Almost a year to get a suppressor back. Yeah, 330 <laughs> days for me. So. Yeah. Not that I know that off the top of my head. <laughs> right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, it was... Uh, so you have to get a license from the state. Then most of the time, they want you to grow certified seeds because there's a difference in between the male and female plants. Okay. Uh, you don't want male plants to pollinate your female plants because then they spike the THC. So then you get what's called hot hemp. Yep. And when you have hot hemp, you have to destroy your entire crop. Yeah, and so I was... <sighs> I spent the last couple of days like trying to do a crash course, listening to any podcast that had anything hemp related. Yep. So I at least knew a little bit or what I was talking about. And from everything that I've, that I've heard, like, so obviously hot hemp happens and there's mm -hmm. nothing you can do about it, but the fact that they just destroy it, can that not be broken down to be used for fibers or yep. anything like that? So I mean, that, le legally, I know you can't, but legally you can't. But but could it be? Oh, yeah. So the the big push I think for a lot of guys with the animal feed is if you're growing CBD for the CBD oil, right? And that's the other thing is if you're growing hemp for fiber, you know you're gonna plant that with you know broadcast technique, right? You're just gonna mm -hmm. big field and do that. Good to go. Get as much as you yeah. can. Um, if you're doing CBD, you're planting it you know every three feet, four feet. You know you might even do a hoop high hoop house or something like that. Yeah. Um, you're probably not going to just grow it out on the side of the road or something like that because it's easy way for the high school kids to come chop down all your crops. But, right. Um, depending on how you grow it and all that, it's if the, the trick is really, and that's why it's hard for guys to get started. That's kind of why we set up a company was the way that you don't get hot hemp is you stay on top of it. Okay. So you go out and you test it more often. And then as you start to see certain things with the, the crop or start to see certain features show up, um, you start looking at it and you say, okay, I need to go test this and see where it is. And then you will see that incremental growth in THC. And then you have to file a license with the state and say, look, I'm going to harvest in the next, I think it's 10 days at this point. Okay. Um, they keep changing it. So by the time this actually goes, it might be three days, it could be three weeks. <laughs> right, know? right. Um, but you got to stay on top of that. And that's part of it is, you know, joining an association or something like that to get those kind of updates so you don't get caught in between. Um, and then as soon as you realize it's starting to creep up, then you go, you can say, okay, I'm going to go harvest this. You harvest it and you dry it and that, that will arrest that, you know, the THC side of it. Right. Uh, but then you start to see people that are like, and then there's a, a barrier too, right? So when the lab does it, they have a, a window, um, their accuracy on their, on their test. So a lot of them are 0 0.3, 0 0.5. So if you have point, you know, 0.6% hemp, that's on the high side of it. Um, then you could te technically get that remediated or that might be inside the window. So when you said, what do you mean by remediated? 
remediate, take it to a place that does THC remediation and get it completely stripped out. And today they pull it out? Yeah. Okay. And the, the product they're coming out with that, so just to give you an idea of the money that's in this, remediated THC oil uh, is 7500 bucks a liter. Wow. I mean, it is ridiculous. This On a global level, this is anticipated, I saw it today, it was $56 billion by 2025. So for a guys who are growing corn and beans and all that kind of stuff, um, everyone sees those kind of numbers and they go, well, I'm done. Like, I'm, I'm changing it up. Martha, go, yeah. go throw away the corn. Yeah. Don't do that. Um, start small. Yeah. Um, you know, Iowa put a cap of 40 acres for people to grow, specifically so they don't go crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, because when you start growing 30,000, 40,000, you're going to have a, well, one, you're going to have a huge market correction yep. where then all of a sudden what you thought you were going to get your input cost, what you, what you based your input cost on is not there for your output. Yep. And then you're going to have a lot of rookies that don't know what the heck they're doing. And, yep. and all of a sudden it's just an absolute mess. Exactly. So, well, and that's something I've always, I've talked about in one of the earlier episodes of this, you know, farmers have always they've never put all their eggs in one basket so no. to speak Should. that's that's why nobody grows just corn nobody grows just soybean they'll grow corn and soybean and maybe a little bit of wheat or whatever they'll flip-flop and then they also might have a welding shop you know and they might have cattle that's the most common one yeah. you know because there's ebbs and flows in in everything that they do so yeah that's a very good very good point the uh the other thing that's interesting about hemp is it is a great um soil conditioning thing. So they actually planted hemp around Chernobyl okay. to take all the radioactivity out of the ground. Oh, no kidding? Yeah. So you plant it wherever it's, you know, you got heavy leads or maybe you've got um, contaminants in the soil or something like that. Uh, you can't sell that for CBD or like that, but you can sell it for fiber or, um, you know, just biomass or something like that. I mean, there's, there's not a, as great a market for it, but if you've got a, a parcel of land where you had grandpa's machine shed on it for mm-hmm. 30 years of the dirt floor, and you can't get in to grow on it because it's just got nothing but, you know, motor oil or something that's leaks. Right, around. right. Or you had a diesel tank fell over in a tornado or something. You know, God knows what. Plant hemp on that ground, you know, maybe a year or two, but it'll, it'll clean it up. Clean it up. Farm hmm. that ground again. So what's, what's the, is there anything different in the plant for fiber as there is a plant for to get it, the CBD oil? There's nothing really different about what's in the plant. It's the way the plant is grown. Okay. So a CBD plant is a short, stocky bush, right? Okay. It's it's just kind of short, round, and, and juicy, right? Yep. You're, you're squeezing that to get the oil. Like me. Yeah, you are short and juicy. <laughs> I'm tall and thick, so I guess I'm on the other side. But, uh, yeah, we, we had a lot of HR moments working together. Right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's so for hemp that's for fiber, it's really tall and long. Okay. Um, so you're talking eight, ten foot tall. A lot of the, the, the ditch weed or the feral hemp, as we like to call it, because, um, you know, legislation is interesting where they hear one word and they, they instantly jump to marijuana. Na- na- naturally, yeah. yeah. So um, you have to, we have to, the hemp industry is always quick to, you know, say this, not this. Do this, don't do this. And right. It's, and it's because it's, it's trying to, to protect everyone in the industry because it's just so, everyone's so paranoid about what it is and how it works, but... The, the fiber stuff, you grow them tall, skinny. You grow acres and acres and acres of it. Okay. Um, if you're growing it for herd, for like bedding, or even for like hemp lumber, which is stronger than oak, um, I mean, you'll get stalks that are like small tree trunks. Okay. Um, and those things are just massive. So how are so how are these, how is this planted? Is, is there a machine that you do it with, like a regular planter like you would your corn, or? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So depending on what you're planting, you could go, I mean, if you're planting clones for a CBD, um, there's some specialized equipment that'll basically, you know, plant it in. Uh, you get the guys that are doing the, the plastic beds, the rice yep. plastic beds, which on a on the huge grows, when you see those out, out in Colorado and stuff like that, you see a guy putting in 40 acres, 50 acres of that, and you're just like, God, what does it cost to put that in? But, right. They must um, get it back out. Otherwise, yeah. there's no guess, sense yeah, of doing working, it. Right. right. But, um, yeah, or you're, you're doing broadcasts, so it's real easy for that. Um, it just depends on what you're doing. And some guys do it by hand. I mean, it's a lot of the equipment and stuff that's coming out of it is basically um, <clears throat> old cotton equipment, okay. old tobacco equipment. That, that makes a lot of sense because of how, like, I spent a lot of time down in the south, yep. um, which is cotton country. And, and the way that that 
is planted yep. or drilled, whatever you want to call it, is is way different than what you'd do with a standard, you know, um, you know, corn bean yeah. type type deal. There's way different yeah. spacing and, and one of the biggest equipment producers for for hemp is actually based in Kilmer, Nebraska. Who who's that? Fish equipment. Okay. Okay. Um, they're not only are they active with the Nebraska Hemp Industry Association on the board, which is the board I'm on two of them, but um, he's on the national board for the Hemp Industry Association. Okay. So. Uh, but it's, it's kind of cool that we're a state that doesn't really grow a ton of hemp right now because we, we're behind the eight ball with rolling it out. That's that's Nebraska in general with most laws and legislation. Yeah, we had 10 people get approved in 2019. Okay. Six people actually grew. One guy had to burn his crop. And what was the reason for having to burn it? Any it was, idea? It was hot. Oh, okay. So he let it go too long or didn't check the cross pollination uh, i think it might have been that he he tested it and then some rain came through that was i think it was that freak rainstorm we got in the fall or whatever okay and he couldn't get his equipment out to go harvest it oh so the window of opportunity from the date that he tested to the time that it was was actually good to, to harvest was was too far was too, too long. far off yeah. and he couldn't do it so um but he, he did it smart he wasn't growing I don't think he was growing more than 100 acres. I think he was right. under 100. So he he still lost some crop, but he didn't necessarily lose everything he had. Any idea what input cost is as far as like, okay, so say I want to start growing hemp. I got to go buy seed. Any idea the cost of that? It, is it, it I, or or in, 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 in relation to your, your standard crops um, that we're all used to? Um, that is a little out of my wheelhouse. But okay. I can tell you that um, again, depending on what you're trying to grow for. So like a, a CBG, which is a different cannabinoid, you know, okay. variant in there. Um, I mean, that's $6 a seed for some places. Okay. Four to $6 a seed is, is uncommon right now. Uh, obviously market prices change and things like that. Yeah. Um, if you're talking about planting for, um, hemp fiber or something like that, I mean, the seed cost is much lower, but it's definitely more than corn, but the, the return is going to be better. Yeah. Um, well, and, and you're not you're you're getting a return on it not as much as if you were growing a cbd mm-hmm. you know so it makes sense that the yeah. seed itself is cheaper and there's and there's even dual uh dual plants where people will it's a dual head combine it's the craziest thing i've ever seen okay um i don't even want to guess how much it costs to actually manufacture this but it's definitely out of my my checkbook range right um, but it's it's basically you have a, a combine up here that's cutting the flowers off, you know, the head's cutting yep. off the flowers. And then down towards the bottom, it's cutting the stalks off. So literally it's sending the flowers to the back, the stalks off to a, a cart, and this is going over for fiber and cordage and, and whatever else, and silage, whatever the case may be. This is going over to be dried into smokable hemp or pure biomass to be turned into CBD. Okay. And, um, you know, it's not, so it's, it's again, it's a question of, what kind of land do you have? What kind of ground do you have? What's your soil chemistry look like? What is, you know, uh, so a lot of guys that get started in hemp will say, all right, I've got this one field in this corner, just doesn't grow anything super amazing. Right. Um, so I'll plant an acre of hemp down there and learn how to do it, you know, um, get an idea of what it is. Because if you, I mean, if you start with an acre to five, you know, you're going to see what it looks like to grow hemp. You're going to see how quickly the plants change. Uh, Hemp will grow differently in Tennessee than it will in Colorado, than it will in right. Canada and all that stuff. So, right. Um, but we all know that what we've seen on everywhere around, around the state grows really well. Yes. Yeah, I hear it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I think once, once, so I think Nebraska and Iowa, I think you'll still see people doing CBD, which is fine. I mean, it, it, it's going to get more widely accepted, more widely used. Um, but I think the real value for us as Midwesterners is going to be in, in doing seed, which is a high protein seed. Um, and then the, the herd, specifically that, that fibrous material and the, the, right. the strands here. Because we can, I mean, got half the guys watching this probably have a couple thousand acres or more under their belt. Yeah. Um, and to grow all that as CBD is just, it's going to drive the price down to the point where it's not worth it anymore. Right. Um, we have a guy that we talked to in Montana that had 15,000 acres in the ground last year. Um, and their warehouse to store that is an old bridge maintenance facility they bought from the state of Montana. Okay. 2.5 million pounds of biomass. Wow. Super sacks full of hemp. They take old shipping containers and turn them into drying facilities and all that kind of stuff. And then they, they're a vertically integrated company. So they'll do, they grow it, they, you know, they process it, they dry it, they, they do all that stuff and they kick out a product. So explain that process. So 
obviously everybody's heard about you know drying a hemp plant right yeah. you know so after you harvest it mm -hmm. then then what's what's the, as a grower what's your next step yeah so assume you're growing it for um the cbd side of the business so you harvest it you dry it um you can then shuck it so you, you send it through some uh, decorticator and it'll pull the, the flower off the end of it okay. or you um you send it as just biomass um, it just depends on what the processor wants. That's the big thing is different processors, different methodology. They will typically dictate the way that they want the product delivered to them. Okay. Um, for people first starting out, you know, the easy way to do it is to start out growing hemp flower because you can either sell it as a smokable hemp flower, like direct, like here you go, or you can then send it to somebody to process it and turn it into CBD. So it gives you two different avenues to go with the same product. And so if, you know, like the guys at Hedge, edge crop prices with beans and corn yeah whoever's going to pay me the most money but with hemp it's a little different because you'll get a lot of guys that will um the recommendation is always have a processor lined up under contract before you put a seed in the ground right that way you have an outlet for it and you're not sitting on it the problem you run into is the industry is still new enough that you get some people that are basing forecasts off of 2018 numbers at 75 grand an acre or something like that well, they don't look far enough ahead into it. So that's kind of where a lot of the effort is in, in finding uh, the reputable people and finding the, the quality people to, to be around. And that's where a lot of what we're doing with the software will help shore that up. So, and is there any processors in Nebraska right Not now? Yet. So where's... I mean, there's, there's the fiber processors that were down in Plattsman. Okay. Um, but they have since moved out. They've they dissolved after some differences between the owners and all that. Oh, gotcha. Um, so where's the, where I, if, if I was a farmer here in Nebraska, where would I have to take my hemp to? Um, you would look <coughs> at, um, there's uh, Wisconsin, there's Minnesota. Um, definitely don't take it to South Dakota just yet. Their governor's dragging their feet really bad for, for hemp up there. Okay. Um, Colorado, obviously, but it'll come. They're, they're talking about putting one in North Omaha, I believe. Okay. Um, just to kind of just the user base of people that they can get from employees and all yeah, that. But, yeah, yeah. Um, so that brings up the ne the next question: How do you transport it? I mean, because essentially, yep, you run into I don't want to call it drug running, yep. but but you're you're hauling a yeah. potential product that could be turned into something. Yep. So the way you transport it, Chris, is you use that batch tracker. There's the, the shameless plug. But, there you go. Um, so, yeah, this is probably a good point. I'll segue into what our software does and helps this whole process. Yeah. Because it's, it's document heavy. It's data heavy. Um, and you don't want guys doing it with, like, Excel spreadsheets and manila folders and stuff like that because that's how people will try to do it. Mm -hmm. And the second you leave that folder on the diner counter or the, you know, the, the coffee university that you're going to with your buddy or something like that, as soon as you leave that somewhere, you're screwed. You're, so, well, you're, yeah, your your paperwork trail's gone. Yeah. So we we built the software that we originally built it for ConAgra for their food tracking needs. Okay. Um, they needed to track recalls and all that. So they went to SAP, which is an enterprise software provider. Um, and they said, no problem. We can do that. Uh, it's $750,000 a license. You'll need 70 of them. Sign here and press art. Wow. And uh, ConAgra did not respond well to that <laughs> i'm sure um, i'm sure i kind of want to be in that meeting if i'm honest but they uh they went to their internal team and said build it for us and they said no problem four hundred thousand dollars or you know whatever the number was 18 months so we go we don't have that time we don't have that time frame so then they came back and they contacted us because we do data science as well right and uh they said, can you build something like this well yeah we can but we want to own it so it's our intellectual property but you're our first customer and they said deal right so we built something that fit a USDA food manufacturing facility with FDA and CDC recall requirements. Okay. We saw um, instances in Mississippi where someone got fentanyl into CBD and six people ended up dying from overdoses. Um, that would be Mississippi. Yeah, that's, that's Mississippi. So, yeah, I, I, that's where I spent the bulk of my time down south. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the state just pulled it all out. They said, there's no way we can test it. No way we can figure it out. So screw it. It's gone. So they pulled all the CBD out to, to avoid loss of life. And we saw the opportunity to step into hemp. So we have a, the way we do it is we, you're a farmer, we have your state license on file, we have your seed certificate on file, we have field notes. So if you're taught, you, you say, this doesn't grow for crap over in this corner, 
uh, use this kind of fertilizer and there's a certain list of approved fertilizers or if you're certified organic, you know, what where your, your organic ingredients came from. Uh, crop insurance inspections, there's crop insurance for hemp now. Okay. Um, your certificates of analysis or COAs, those get logged in there as well. Shipping manifests, so if, if you're in Lincoln and I'm in Omaha and I'm driving your truckload down here, it says I left Omaha at 3 p.m. and I showed up in Lincoln at 4.06 p.m. Uh, if the state patrol pulls them over, they can hit a QR code. Actually, kind of just like what's on the, the deer head here. Right. But you hit that QR code and it gives them chain of custody all the way back to the farm. Gotcha. Well, and the reason I asked that is one of the podcasts I was listening to, I, and I forget what it was. It was some, some guy up in Pennsylvania and uh, Lincoln Farming, maybe. I don't know if sure. you've heard of it, but um, he was telling a story about a guy that packaged everything up and it went on to a... Uh, FedEx truck was going was going straight to the deal, and it ended up at NYPD. Yep. So I've talked to both ends of that equation. Okay. Um, the guy who shipped it was 108 pounds. Of yep. Smokable hemp flour. Yep. Going to a cancer facility inside New York. Okay. And um, the FedEx guy thought it looked suspicious, so he he flagged it. They got a search warrant. And they seized it. Um, NYPD tweeted the picture. If if you Google NYPD hemp bust, it's the thing yeah. that comes up and, and gross. Um, but you know, it's it's not you know those damn cops. I mean, you think about it. If you pull over a truckload and it's got not to interrupt you, I, I typed in NYPD in my Google search bar. First, for the listen, the first thing that pops up is NYPD Blue, which was an amazing American drama series back in the day. I don't know if you ever watched oh, yeah. it as a kid. That was like our family time sitting around. And the second one is NYPD Hemp Bust. Yeah. So, because at the time it was the largest marijuana bust for like 20 years or something crazy like that. And so we've got people that are family members that are in the DEA with our employees. Right, okay. We've got friends that are law enforcement and all that. We've got um, some advisors that are law enforcement. Like, look, when you pull over hemp, what's the deal? The DEA guy goes, not my problem. It is not a drug anymore. I don't care. I, w- I don't want the paperwork. Get it off my plate. So they okay. want to disqualify it as, a, as, is this marijuana or not? Nope, it's hemp. Cool. I don't have to deal with it then. Get it off my desk. Um, law enforcement guys. Oh, yeah. Four big old bags. Yep. Law enforcement guys, you know, state patrol, whatever, they pull somebody over. They need to know real fast if it's if it's Chris driving the hemp to get processed in Omaha. Yeah. Or if it's a cartel because it's a completely different traffic stop. Yeah. And the only real safe thing to do from a safety standpoint is to detain the guy, seize the truck, and impound the evidence until you can figure out what it is. You don't want to do it on the side of the interstate. Right. You know, you want to do it somewhere it's safe on stuff. So, But with your product, they can look instantly as soon as the guy walks up to the window. Yep. They and they know. They through a third party and see, okay, this is Chris. I think he's probably not... A cartel guy, so I don't have to worry about him tomorrow. But if they see you in Scott's Bluff with a shipment that's supposed to go from Omaha to Lincoln, your story doesn't match, and you've got a third party logging that, or all of a sudden you go back to what the hell are you doing? I took a wrong turn somewhere. Yeah, I got really lost. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Uh, heading, we, heading to Wall Drug. <laughs> yeah. The damn sign said this way to Wall Drug, and I just kept going. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we actually so we actually give the license to law enforcement for free. That's that's cool. So, and I know with like my current day job with, with waste oil and the stuff that we do with, with our furnaces and, and just waste oil in general, the EPA is super strict on how that used oil is being transported. Is there any kind of regulations or laws with hemp of how it needs to be or how they want to see it, I guess? Yes and no. So... The latest thing I heard, and this, may not, this is how fast this industry moves, this may not even be current as of, of you and I talking about it, but there was a motion passed to have, in the state of Nebraska, anytime you transport more than one pound of hemp, and keep in mind, hemp farmers that grow it on a decent scale, a decent scale is 30 acres or less, measure hemp in tons. Right. Not in pounds. Right, right. Anything more than one pound of hemp has to be registered with the state patrol seven days before you transport so i'm a, i'm i'm a guy that's going to transport it or I, I got my hemp and i'm getting ready to send it to wherever yep. 
I call them, file paperwork? File paperwork, most likely. Okay. It's not through yet. Um, believe me, I've been burning up the phone line to the State Patrol because um, I, I love, if you haven't been a fan of the Facebook page for the Nebraska State Patrol, they handle well-placed trolling very well. Yes, they do. Enforcement agency. Yes, they do. And they have, I said, look, if I ever cross the line, just delete it, I won't be upset. And I'm like, no, we think it's funny as hell. Yeah. Um, so I really commend those guys for doing that. That's yeah. an easy job. No, absolutely not. Um, but yeah, so that's the current mode. But if if and when we get the, the default on with the states, we give a state license to the state of Nebraska for free as well so that you and I, as a taxpayer, don't have to spend $20 million to build this solution. It's already built. It's very Republican of you. Well, it's, <laughs> I mean, truthfully. Well, <laughs> it, I mean, maybe I shouldn't have said that. But but no, that's, that's, that's awesome because yeah. it's... The, the reason anybody's doing any of this is is to make money. Yep. And then if if party A who's growing it and, and transporting it is making money, but then me as party B is paying for everybody to pull licenses and yep. that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. you're robbing Peter to pay Paul, and looked, essentially. And there's yeah. and God knows there's enough of that yeah. out there. And we looked at it and we said, you know, this all the state's going to do is run a report. And with the way that we built this, we built it so the data set is strong and the front end looks pretty after the fact. Everyone else builds them, the, the front end is super pretty, and then they like duct tape and bailing wire their data set together. So any app you've ever been using to log anything and it just doesn't work anymore, mm -hmm. they had to change their data set and they tore it down and go, it's not worth it. And they just never spun up the next version of it. Right. So we built this specifically to adjust to legislation, adjust to requirements, adjust to needs. So. Um, but with the guy that got caught with 108 pounds, yeah. so I sent an email to every governor in the United States, which is an interesting exercise in beating your head against the wall. But I got it done. It took me about a morning. Um, the two governor offices that reached out to me was the New York State Director of Cannabis. Okay. Um, and, you know, it was something where I knew that that had happened because I would talked to the, the guy that sent the shipment. And he goes, look, I'm, I'm suing the state of New York right now. I can't. I can't invest in this. Like, dude, I will give you a license if you will give me the story for this. Right. And he's like, I, 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 I got problems. I, I can't, you know, and, and I didn't want to push the guy because, you know, he's he's got a serious PR issue and everything else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the director of campus is like, this this is huge. This could be exactly what we're looking for, and you're giving it to us. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's paid for by the people that use it. You're running reports, you know, and you need to see it as much as the rest of us. Yeah. And we said... That way... Yeah. That doesn't happen. There's no PR nightmare then. Yep. There's no FedEx guy taking time out of his yep. day to flag it. Because that'll know. happen. Because it'll yeah. be... So, so how, does it, how does it work then if, if, say that guy does it, he decides to FedEx it, mm -hmm. right? Rather than manually transport it himself or have a third-party carrier, you yep. know? And is there, like, QR codes that go on the box or the packaging or... Yep. And we and again we built it flexible so that if FedEx says we need a QR code on the box, perfect, we just use the QR code for the box. Okay. Uh, or they say, you know what, I need a shipping manifest that has the QR code on the shipping manifest. So it's a list of papers that's got. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I mean, we the way we built it. So if you're if you're my hemp driver and you're driving it for me, we take a picture of you, the truck, the license plate. Um, you know, do the proof of life. We could hold up the Omaha World Herald or the Lincoln Journal Star for that day. And take, I mean, right, right. Whatever right, yeah. you feel comfortable with. Yeah. You know, I mean, you could do that for the system. And that's... That's cool. We built it because, you know, pet people are, one, the, the most laid back, fun loving people I've ever met. Right. Um, we have a blast every time we go anywhere. And everyone is super excited to see people that aren't like the, the stereotype. I mean, people hear hemp and they think, God, a bunch of hippies. Right. You know, and those guys are out there, but then you you're start seeing, far from a hippie. You got no hair. Yeah, yeah, no hair, beard, <laughs> tattoos, and guns. Yeah, I'm, you're, I'm, I'm as anti hippie as like not anti hippie, but right. Uh, you're far as far away from being a hippie as yeah. as possible. Yeah. So it's um, but it's been a, a, a good endeavor for us. We've had a lot yeah. of fun with it. So so to recap, hemp batch tracker basically start to finish. Helps the farmers kind of like a business software mm -hmm. system um, or a business development system, really, I guess, so to speak. Um, Drives the value for them all the way through. So they're they're able to say, I, you know, imagine two guys show up to sell product and one guy's got a, a manila folder with coupons and 
shit falling out, coffee stains on it. Another guy shows me, did you get that email I sent you two days ago? Yeah, or it pulls out an iPad or something yeah. or whatever. Yeah, that, okay. yeah. It's, uh, and the processor or the buyer is going to be like, well, this makes my life a hell of a lot easier because then they can put that QR code on the bottle, put it on the whatever. So you can sit in a store and go, you know, so what's the difference between this one and this one? I don't know if this is from China or if this is from, you know, Lancaster County, Nebraska. Right. You know? Right. I mean, it, it could be, down the line, it could be like wine in California where it's, this is low dye and this is, right. you know, this is... This uh, was grown in so no, March during the seasonal rain that's added this whatever to, yeah. I would love to see some some big, just, you know, sausage-fingered, you know, deep barrel-chested, you know, like that guy, like you and me combined, but like just, rah, like, come on down to... Have my CBD. It's fresh bottled outside Valparaiso, Nebraska. You yeah, know, something, right. Something like that. Uh, yeah, that'd be hilarious to me. But that's what'll happen. So, getting back on CBD a little bit. Obviously, most people have heard about it, yeah. under, but probably don't understand it because I didn't understand a lot of it until yeah. you know doing what little research I did for this, and, and then now learning from you. What, what other than um, joint issues or whatever? What are some other uses for it? Um, they're using CBD for PTSD and veterans. Okay. They're using CBD in um, people with anxiety issues, people with, um, uh, you know, it's it's basically, because it's, it's something where it isn't FDA approved, so you can't say it actually cures this. Right. But it does help alleviate the symptoms of, and so you'll see that a lot of times. Yeah. And people get in a lot of hot water when they say it cures this, but... Uh, you'll see cancer patients take it to mm -hmm. suppress the vomiting when they're taking chemotherapy, uh, which is why those people are getting that flower in New York because they, when you smoke it, the bioabsorption through your lungs is so much faster than anything else because when you're taking chemo, you're not expecting to be sick, but you know it's coming. So it's, you know, to smoke CBD and get that rapid absorption to suppress that means that you can keep some weight on you and, and fight the disease. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so you'll see it for PTSD, for cancer. You'll see it for um, seizures, things like that. Okay. Um, I mean, it's just, it's one of those things. I hate to be the guy that's like, it's it's the, you know, buy the, the oil for me and my network marketing thing and, you know, put it, mix it with lavender and put it in a diffuser. Right, right. I mean, it's something where it, it has a lot of different ways you can use it and, and it's worth reading into, especially if you have something where, uh, like our, our uh, the president of our company had a, uh, uh, inflamed ver uh, vertebrae so he had sciatica was all jacked up and he was just hurting like crazy so he he started taking cbd for the first time really when, when, it, when it happened and he's like this okay. is ridiculous and it calmed everything down for him a little bit it didn't didn't make it go away completely but but it had, made it manageable he was maxing out his daily allowance of ibuprofen so right he was wrecking his liver yeah and then he started taking cbd and you know it's not a big deal so so then jump on over to the fiber side. Mm -hmm. I know we've, we've mentioned fiber. We haven't ever talked about things that that can be used for. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can make uh, hempcrete, which is fire resistant, believe it or not. So like concrete. Yeah. Okay. So we can put one of your, your fuel water burners, set it up on one side, and it'll be cool to touch on the other side. Wow. And I know your stuff is blazing hot. Like yeah. I ran into you at the Nebraska Power Show. Yep. I stood there talking to you for what two minutes, and I think I singed some arm hair. <laughs> yeah. I've melted a pair of coveralls a couple uh, of times, so yeah. As, yeah, um, but yeah, so you can you can do that. It's cool to the touch of the back. It's flame retardant. Um, you can do uh, Lotus. The car guys they made yep. a Lotus Elise out of hemp. Yeah, um, it's all it's on par with carbon fiber, but the cost is significantly less. So weight wise, you're saying as as far as what what in strength, I'm assuming pretty. Uh, they used the herd and they pressed it with a polymer and they kind of made it into body panels. And okay, stuff. okay, um, gotcha. It's pretty wild looking. Yeah. Um, you can use the the fiber and all that for it in lithium batteries. Okay. Um, it actually gets not lithium batteries, but in uh, rechargeable batteries, it gets you better uh, conductivity and not as much parasitic catalyst or I don't know what the chemistry is, but putting in batteries, they're putting it in. Um, uh, you, know, you use it for like bedding, so the fabrics, all that kind of stuff. I mean, burlap sacks and rope, everyone's seen that forever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but you're starting to see it more and more in the, especially in the, the green movement of, hey, this needs to be biodegradable, things like that. Okay, yeah. So you'll see it being pushed more and more into mainstream, Patagonia, Adidas, uh, some of the bigger bigger manufacturers. Like, we need more of this. It's like, okay. cool. Well, the guys that are producing it aren't producing it on a scale to feed Nike's, you know, appetite. For right, fabric. right, right. But I think when Nebraska and, and the Midwest comes online, all of a sudden you'll start seeing the 
capacity to, to feed that need. What What about pla plastics, yep. right? Because so California, if they made hemp straws, mm -hmm. would not have to outlaw them essentially. Or you could just drink from the cup. <laughs> <laughs> the thing has never made any sense to me at all. They have to make paper straws or aluminum straws. Like just drink from the damn cup. Right, so right. You drink from the damn cup. Do you want to? Yeah. So, so tell us, tell us the story about about this deal. All right. So, I am because because you own some property in. I am a laird of both Glencoe and Lochaber, Scotland. Okay. I own land in Scotland because of the laws over there. I can legally call myself a lord or laird, and I chose laird. So my my estate is a whopping, uh, and I cannot grow hemp on it too for the for the record. But it is a whopping one hundred and one square feet. <laughs> um, so, but uh, I was over there on a, a trip with some family, that, and uh, our guide was telling us, he goes, "Yeah, you want to become a lord of Scotland?" I'm like, "Hell yes, I want to become a lord of Scotland." Right. So we hit this thing, and it's basically a nature trust that is selling parcels of land that was once uh, uh, logging ground. Uh, so that um, if they do come to come back to get it, they have to buy out every single individual person with one square foot. Oh, gotcha. So okay. Absolutely, you can't unwind it. It's just a, this will forever be. Um, I can't title a car under it or look at that. Do you have to pay taxes on it? No. Nope. No, that's all right. Then. So one time it was like 110 bucks, something like that. Who 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 does your your mowing? Uh, nobody. I can't mow it. It's it has to remain wild ground for the, oh, gotcha. the Scottish wildcat. Gotcha. So you're not gonna have some asshole neighbor being like, "Hey, Lord, blah blah blah, his but grass I, is getting too I tall." I can go camp on that land. So yeah. If you're ever in Scotland, anyone watching this, if you're in Scotland, <laughs> if you want to go to Loch Aber, Scotland, and go camping, it, it's on Airbnb. Yeah. <laughs> I can't put it on Airbnb. Oh really? <laughs> oh believe me, I've, I've tried it all. I can't license. I can't, yeah. You know, but they're they're good. It's an it's a novelty. Yeah. yeah, that's cool. It's a good way to do fundraising, and and uh, so legally, with the laws the way they're written, because I own that land. Uh, I could be all high and mighty and say I am Laird Trowbridge of Loch Aver and Glencoe. That's cool. And uh, it's you know so if anyone wants to do it, it's HighlandTitles.com. I mean it's all web based. And, yeah. Um, the guy over there, nice guy, had a, had a heart for uh, nature preserve, but could not sell anything. Couldn't close the screen door. Yeah. Just, I literally like I will pay you. Money I think I've hired a couple of those of guys screen. before. Like, well, here's what we do. I'm like, no, I, I want to buy this right now. Well, what did, what did I tell you about? Like, I just want to buy it. Like. Look, we're going to lunch, dude. Like, there's, <laughs> yeah. a, there's a distillery down the road that we are coming yeah. into the time. And he's like, "Well, so the wildcat." I'm like, uh. "This kind of sounds like were you were you at the dealership when Craig Cox started I don't there?" Remember. I don't remember if you were or not. If you had already left, um, him and I were sitting up at the sales tower. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. It was probably a Wednesday night at nine o'clock at night, yeah. waiting for people to finish up. And we started talking about being ordained ministers. He 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 went and got his did a class yeah. and whatever and became an ordained minister and all that stuff. I'm like, yeah, sounds pretty cool. Yeah. So then I did it. Yeah. And I got a parking pass and yeah. an actual badge and and all that kind of stuff. So hey. anybody needs a wedding done, I'd yeah. be more than happy to do it and it'll be fun. Um, but anyway, back yeah. to back yeah. to the whiskey. So, what do we what do we got so here? We hit a distillery. The guy asked where we wanted to go and he's like, you'll go to the foyer. I'm like, no, let's go somewhere that. It's just off the charts. And he goes, so let's go to the Singleton of Glenord. And it's this little tiny distillery up in a creek. Um, and they make uh, single malt scotch. Um, this is 18-year-old single malt from okay. Singleton of Glenord. You can buy it at the distillery. Or you can buy it in Southeast Asia for 1000 bucks a bottle. So this would be like a $200 shot. Yeah. Probably. That's, that's why I brought the pint. Not the <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's one of those things where they don't even sell it in Scotland. Yeah, like you can drink it at the distillery, and that's it. Um, so it's um, it's kind of one of those things where I, I, I had to have it, and then so my dad's bottle broke on the way back. Yeah, and they 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 didn't throw away the luggage; they kept sniffing it until the flavor and smell went away. Right. And then my brother broke his bottle or lost his bottle. I can't remember which one it is. So this arguably may be the only single of Glenor in the whole Midwest, if not the state. Well, I'm uh, anxious to try it. So this is for not punching you in the face all those times. There you go, and I'll take it. That's good. Yeah. I can see how you can get in trouble. Yeah. With it. Yeah. That's yeah, that's real uh, good. That's why you kind of restrict a little bit, but no, it's good stuff. Yeah. Sweet. But yeah. Well, 
thanks for coming, obviously. Yeah. Thanks for taking time out of your schedule. I know you got a lot going on. Where can they find you, your sure. company, your... Yeah, so... Pimp yourself out here. It. All right, so um, first and foremost, if you're going to get into hemp, go to reach out for people, right? So the Nebraska Hemp Industry Association um, is doing free consulting for hemp licenses. So if you're wanting to get a license started, um, pick an acre, pick two, pick four. You know, don't do a ton of acres, but do it this year because next year the guys that are going to do it will look for people to help lead and, and, and be those guys. So, yeah. Um, it's something where the more people we can get doing it this year, the better. Um, planting season is basically from March until August, September, just depends. Um, you say it again, Mar March? March? I think it's March to August or September. Okay, so the guys that are going to do it, they're going to have stuff in the ground in yeah. five days, ten days, whatever. Yeah, they might. They, I mean, it depends on where you start, too. I mean, you start yeah. clones, whatever, but... Um, but you know, getting a part of that is always good. You know, it resources people um, where to go for stuff, especially when it's not real obvious. You know, yeah. we have a, a seed store just sitting on the corner right now. But uh, for us, uh, we're just at batchtracker.com. Um, you know, if uh, somebody wants to check it out, there's plenty of information there. Um, any of the contact stuff goes to my inbox. I'll be able to see it and help people out. Um, you know, if anybody mentions you guys, obviously we'll take care of them. And we'll take yeah. care of them anyway. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. We'd rather set up Nebraska. Than they would the state of New York, but as a company, when the state of New York goes, I would love to use your product. You got to do what's best for the bottom line. We, we kind of might go with New York. Yeah. Um, same conversation was had with Chicago, with Illinois, actually, not Chicago. Okay. Um, I actually got in a fight with Utah because they were like, "This is marijuana." I know it's hemp. I know it's right. marijuana. So there were about six emails back and forth with the governor's office in Utah going, "This is hemp." Like, right. I had to give her this, the farm bill and the line item. She's like, "Oh, this is hemp. Well, this is USDA." Right. <laughs> Um, any social media places that people want to follow yeah. you guys? We're on Facebook. Uh, we're on LinkedIn. Okay. Um, we don't tweet because nobody needs Dude, up to the second tweets from us. I'm going to tell you this. So I've tried a Twitter account probably three times. And it works for about three days. And then I get frustrated with it because I can't like truly figure it out. Yep. And I fancy myself as somebody that's pretty good at technology. Um but that Twitter, man, I... Unless, you're, unless your audience is looking for up-to-the-second updates... Yeah. Twitter, I feel like, for most people that are our age, I mean, we're both, you know, around the same age. We're technology-savvy kind of yeah. guys. We've both been in sales, so we know we've got to reach out to people. Yeah. I mean, it's just kind of like, I, I, don't, I don't need to know what you do on an hourly basis. Right. I do use Twitter to get info, right? Following Absolutely. sports games or you know, breaking news updates, that kind of stuff. But yeah, I... And people are fickle too. Like if you start posting like having McDonald's, just had a coffee, or just fell on the ice. If you start doing that kind of stuff, people just tune you out because you're, yeah. you're not interested. Well, you got to have, you got to have something worthwhile with some context in it. You know, I remember shoot, way back in the day when Facebook was just becoming a, a deal. Um, I think I was an internet sales manager um, at a Chevy store um, in Omaha at the time and I took a bunch of classes on it and you're supposed to post 10 non-sales non-promotional type posts before you post one yep. you know for sale or buy from me because type of deal yep. you know um, so it's the same thing kind of goes when I mean I don't need to know that you're going and getting your nails done for yep. the third time this week or you know Whatever. And it's funny. I just remember we were at the Iowa Power Farming Show, and a guy was walking down the row, and I was like, "Do you drive a limited F one hundred and fifty Rev one?" And he goes, "How the hell do you know that?" I was like, "I'm the one who sold it to you, you crazy old Danish bastard." Yeah. He was some. He was, I forget the guy's name. He told me a second time, but he's a big guy, real big guy, real intimidating. He's like, "Oh, you don't need this," and kept blowing things up, blowing things up, and and I I finally just got one. I look. You're gonna take this crazy old coot, and you're gonna buy this truck. And he goes, yeah. Well, I don't, you know, whatever. And everyone's freaking out that I was like insulting this guy, but he absolutely loved it. Yeah, hey, you gotta know your audience. Well, so the two other guys that are with him are crying, laughing. I go, "What's so funny?" He's like, "He's like, I'm his son. That's his grandson. I drive the truck now. He gets it next year." <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. That brings me since we're talking about social media and vehicles. I have a huge pet peeve. I don't know if you've seen it or not. People who put their Snapchat or Instagram or Twitter handles yeah. 
on their like not business uh, businesses yeah, i get yeah. it business, sure. but their personal ones like on the side of their window like some honey's gonna roll up like oh yeah i'm oh, gonna yeah. go find him on the insta twitter you know i mean <laughs> so we we've actually we, we run the omaha data science academy we train people to be data science okay and um we train everybody we have a big they, we're trying to get the FFA to, to help us help kids that want to get into data. Yeah. Come off the farm and all that kind of stuff because ag and data is huge and people don't oh, seem to catch that. It's ag and data is yeah. like. Well, people look at like, people go, well, how big is it? Like, well, you've heard of the farmer's almanac? <laughs> it's 200 years of data right there. Right. You know? Right. Um, but so we, we do the training and all that kind of stuff and we, we want to have some fun with it, right? Because we want to see who's paying attention, who's looking for it. So we have all these Easter eggs hidden all over our website for that. Okay. So when you, like one of them, there's a page and you scroll down, there's a little tiny logo and you can't see what it is and you click on it, it's like, it's the scene from Idiocracy where they're talking about Brondo. Yeah. It's got electrolytes. It's got what plants crave, you know, and that. So, but one of them is a Rick Roll. Ooh. So, I love me a good Rick Roll. So I think if I'm going to do what you're talking about, I would do it where it's a Rick Roll. And guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to edit in a Rick Roll right now. <laughs> but anyway cool well again thanks hey, very much for yeah, coming pleasure. it's been a blast it's been great catching up yeah. um it's like i said on, on my end it's been awesome watching you do what you've yeah. been doing and and uh get a long way away from the car business and and into something that uh obviously fits what you're doing and yeah. makes you happy and and uh as a former manager that's 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 why i always did it yeah. is for everybody to have a better life or, or do what they love to do. So it's cool to be able to see that. And, yeah, it's cool, and, uh, it's cool to, to keep in touch with people that, that you work with. And uh, I was in a different headspace back then, to tell you the truth, because I was- Well, the car business puts you in a different headspace in, in a lot of it. That makes that dealership a little more toxic for me than I think I needed it to be. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it was, uh, yeah, when, you're, when your GM says, hey, can you come back to the dealership? We just fired someone and we need your concealed carry. Yeah. That's a little cowboy, a little more cowboy than I think I want to be. Yeah. So. No, I, I agree. I agree. Uh, anyway, thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for coming in and yeah. until next time. Bye.